Welcome, everybody, to another episode of MOIP, or uh, Money Over Internet Protocol. And today I have a special guest, somebody I've known for a very long time, David Bars, who spent most of his career on uh, Wall Street and can tell us uh, a lot of the things that you guys want to know. So I'll be asking him a bunch of questions, and uh, hopefully he'll give us all the all the inside knowledge that they collected in 30 something years being on Wall Street. Thank you, David, for joining. It's my pleasure to be here, especially for you, Alex. <laughs> so give us a little bit of a background, like how you started, where did you grow up, how did you get to Wall Street, and, and uh, uh, how did you get to where you are today? So I, I grew up in New York and um, my father was an attorney. I always wanted to be an attorney, but I think uh, deep down had this um, uh, inner drive for uh, the common central focus of all those who want to go on Wall Street, which is uh, called money. And uh, if, if, you, if you really want to make money, uh, being a successful person on Wall Street is, uh, is one of the ways to do it. And, um, and so practicing law for me uh, was, was a conduit, if you will, for, for ultimately uh, accessing uh, a, a job on the street. I, I was fortunate while I was in law school to clerk for a bankruptcy judge. This was a time when bankruptcy was not a, uh, if you will, a, a field of the legal profession that was held in high esteem. Uh, most of the bankruptcy lawyers would hang around courts waiting for a company to go bankrupt and then swoop in like vultures, which is one of the reasons why uh, you, you sometimes hear the term vulture investor. Um, it came out of the bankruptcy bar. And, and ultimately, uh, when I graduated from law school in 1987, uh, just a month after starting my job, something happened in October that uh, many, many of your viewers might not know about, uh, but I'm sure they do, uh, the stock market crashed. And, um, and what that led to over the next three years was a wave of bankruptcy, bankruptcies that, uh, that started to, in effect, bec become the creation for a secondary market in transacting in bankruptcy claims. Bankruptcy claims was a broad term that applied to everything from the senior most debt in the capital structure of a company all the way down to trade vendors vendors who have sold goods were waiting for payment of the of the receivable and then didn't get it those became claims in a bankruptcy proceeding and people transacted in those things so um i started representing uh many of the investors that were historically hedge funds uh, mostly risk arbitrageur hedge funds who evolved because a bankruptcy investment is no different than a risk arbitrage. It was a, uh, a, a predetermined workout, the bankruptcy process, and you could buy a claim and project what your outcome would be. And it was just a matter of timing of money. And I, and, and, but the problem was these were not securities. And so transacting in those, um, and those instruments required a lawyer to paper them. And so here I was representing uh, many of the investors who were participating in this market. I would charge a legal fee of $5,000 and the investor was making $5 million. So I knew uh, something was wrong with that equation. And when I reached out to one of my clients to say, you know, I think I'm going to leave my legal job, uh, he offered me a job, as did many of my other clients. So I, all of a sudden, I became uh, a, a, a wanted commodity. Why is that the case? In, in 1984, they had amended the bankruptcy code. Not a lot of folks knew about the terms of those amendments. And with the crash of the market and then the ultimate recession uh, that lasted into the early 90s, there weren't a lot of folks who had the education and experience that I had. So I parlayed that into a job at a firm known and uh, then then known as just newly known as third avenue management and uh, and i joined it as their general counsel in 1991 and uh and ultimately helped grow and create that business let me make one last comment that's indicative of today 
as I said to you, the stock market crashed in 1987. Investments in distressed securities really lasted until 1992. I would say that's when the market started to become, uh, if you will, overpopulated, less, uh, less exciting, less interesting. Granted, the information age didn't exist as it does today. Many of us didn't even have computers on our desks. But I would say that for what's going on today with what the pandemic may have or, or, or may have not done to various businesses and industries, which we'll get into, it does take time for some of those distressed opportunities to play themselves out. So we timing markets is probably the hardest thing to do. So and I think Third Avenue uh, manages something like twenty billion dollars, right? At the peak, thirty-one billion at its peak. Thirty-one billion. Sorry for discounting it. But uh, so obviously one of the big players uh, on Wall Street. Um, so let me hit you with a big question right off the top. So we we are going through this Corona pandemic. We're going through a depression or a recession, whatever you want to determine it, right? And normal process, I mean, you're an expert in, in bankruptcy, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you, is normal process would be, instead of the government and the Fed throwing a blanket or a, a net under everybody, would be to go through what the American economy and, the, and, and America is famous for, right? The law. Everybody follows the same process, and the bad companies are going to go through bankruptcy, and we're going to come out of that better. But that's not what we're doing here. That's not what we did in 2008. So tell me what's your thoughts about that, <clears throat> and and uh, you know, do you think we're doing the right things or not? And and give me your argument as to why, uh, why you think the way you think. Well, <clears throat> it's it's hard to say whether what the Fed's doing to support the market is is wrong or not. Uh, I think history will will have to be the judge of that. I will say that it's been well reported that investors who are participants in the distressed marketplace are very upset with what the Fed's doing because the Fed has eliminated or um, really taken away the opportunity for some of those distressed investors to buy cheaply and then make their own determination as to how to restructure that company. Instead, the Fed's become what, what became known out, as, as out of the uh, financial crisis of 2008 and 9, the extend and pretend mechanism for many of these companies by supporting them with market purchases of debt securities. So I, I don't know today the answer to your question of whether that's good or bad. Um, it depends upon who, who you're asking, and then it will depend upon the ultimate way in which these companies either survive or ultimately fail in any event. Just buying up the debt securities of some of these high, highly leveraged companies um, may, may be a Band-Aid for them, but it may not ultimately um, work itself out for them because you've seen, especially some of the large box retailers are already, they've already gone in, a lot of the oil and gas companies have already gone in, and there's there's going to likely be a lot more companies that are going to file. But as I, as I said, I think my point earlier, there's going to be some time that's going to stretch out before we see how that works itself out, notwithstanding what the Fed's doing. And so at the end of the day, you've had massive, since my story from before of what happened in the early 90s, there have been a massive new market created in, in distressed funds. You know, firms were created out of that. You know, right. for like Oak Tree, now the largest uh, bankruptcy investor, if you will, now owned by Brookfield Asset Management, a Canadian company, which is, makes it even larger, you know, has something like uh, $100 billion in assets under management focused on uh, allegedly distress led by the, you know, the, the, the Mar Howard Marks, who writes uh, obsessively about the market and is the one most upset about losing this opportunity. So he, he got screwed uh, because he can't buy stuff on the cheap. You know what? I'm sure the government's not upset about that. So well, I, I, I work with those guys on, on a few deals, but uh, I'm not so worried about him or Warren Buffett sitting on $100 billion and not being able to deploy. What I'm worried about is more about moral hazard and about 
the fact that uh, we are printing this money and when we're spending it on the past instead of spending it on the future. And, and recessions are normal economic cycle. I mean, if you listen to Ray Dalio or any of the other people who talk about this stuff, they always mention, they always basically say, look, you, you can kick it down the road, you can de defer it, but you're not going to avoid it, right? And, and all we're doing is creating, we know how this ends. I mean, we, we just have to look at Japan, who's 10 or 20 years ahead of us, and see how it ends, right? I mean, the Japanese central bank owns close to 80% of all the securities and all the debt that is issued in Japan. So is that a good thing or a bad thing, you know? So, so I, I, my concern, you know, I came to this country as an immigrant, and my concern is, is for this shiny house at the hill is no longer shiny and it's not on the hill. It's, like, it's more like a, it, it's in a valley that is filled up with debt, you know? So that's what my concern is about how my children, how are your children are uh, gonna come out of this. Yeah, there's no, there's no question uh, that, um, that your concern is, is well-founded. Uh, while we're talking, my, my driveway is being dug up uh, by a construction worker right now, and he said to me, can you pay me in cash? You must have one of those printing presses in your basement. <laughs> and I laughed and I said, uh, no, I think that only the government owns one of those. Uh, but don't worry about it. It's just going to be a problem for our children. So that was the conversation I just had with someone performing a, a you know, a well-needed service uh, as we speak. So you, you're, you've identified a real problem and uh, there are all kinds of folks who have belief systems in what the, the ultimate outcome will be. And I think those will be debates that will continue. And unfortunately, uh, this is intended to be a a political conversation, but it will it will evolve into politics as it always does. Yeah, and and look again, I, I don't care if it's Republican or Democrat or or half and half, right? I mean, the issue is more about do we all care for America and do we do we want this country to stay the economic power that it is? And and for me, the concern is that really, you know, we have this this amazing thing called the U.S. dollar which became the reserve currency of the world. And we just take it for granted. It's like, uh, it's like our kids take us for granted and say, oh, you know, I can just draw on my parents for as long as I want, right? They're always gonna be there. And uh, so, and, and we are risking, every time we print more money, we're risking losing the trust of the rest of the world in this reserve currency. Now, I'll, I'll admit that and there is no other currency that is as good as the US dollar. And that's why the US dollar is getting stronger and not weaker in this crazy environment. But sooner or later, debasing that currency is going to get us into a situation where people you know, just don't want dollars. They're gonna want something else. And, and there's no recovery for it from it. It's not, like, it's not like you can run back and say, okay guys, okay, we, we realize, okay, now we printed too many dollars. Okay, let us take some money, some, some flow off the market and make you go back to trusting us, right? So, so what, what do you look, when you look at, the function of the Fed, what the Fed actually was created to do, and you look at what they're doing today, and there, there are miles apart, right, between what they were created for, which was like, again, moral hazard, we, uh, saving the markets in case everything just goes to, to a catastrophic event, which, which we kind of had, right? It was one thing, it's fine. It's fine to kind of stop the music and say, okay, fine, all the chairs are still here, don't worry about it, we're just gonna bridge it for two months, but there's a big difference between that and saying, I'll buy anything. I'll be here for it. I'll, I'll cover anything, right? So, so my concern is for the U.S. dollar. I'm not so concerned about the Fed or Treasury or anybody else. And, and that's, I think there's a disconnect. A lot of people who are in the financial markets think that the power of the U.S. comes from the military or comes from our genius of building these amazing companies. And I keep saying, no, the, the source of the power is the fact that we can print trillions of dollars and nothing happens. No one else can do that. Right. Yeah. I, look, I, I agree. There's a there's a, a a component of this though that one can argue that the market did drop, you know, pretty substantially in a very short period of time. Maybe an unprecedented. Uh, I think that was unprecedented how quickly it dropped. I'm not 100 percent sure if that's right, but I think it is. All time record. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and and so we have now. Um, the Fed stepping in and making purchases of securities. In, in rare cases during the 2008-9 crisis, other than what happened with Fannie and Freddie, 
um, the government supported the economy but didn't didn't really get much out of it. Now we're seeing a little bit smarter, I think, moves by the Fed where I think they're not going to hold these securities forever. They'll eventually sell them into the market as things stabilize with some pretty built-in decent gains, right? If they were, it's not clear exactly how much of what they bought, but but I think that's part of their mission is uh, they might become a little bit more capitalistic in the way they're thinking about this. So yes, it's it's it could be a moral hazard if it doesn't work out that way, but if it does, well, you could see history. That's why I say you need history to judge some of these things. We could find out a couple of years from now that they built they they booked multi hundred billion dollar gains in what they did, and all of a sudden they right. restored actually, all that money. Instead of printing money, they actually created some uh, assets on their balance sheet, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah, look, I agree with you that there is two scenarios here. There's a scenario where everything just works out perfectly, and and we you know I'm just a uh, you know, uh, calling a, an alarm on something that is not an issue, right? And 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 I, I painted that scenario. I think in one of one of the AMAs that I did, I, I talked about the fact that that yes, if you reflate everything and the U.S. does recover and and we are going back to nice GDP, uh, there is a scenario where we purchase our own debt and we keep it at zero interest rates, and we eventually recover from all of this, right? So I'm not saying, oh, you know, we're doomed, there's no way out of this. But <clears throat> to get that economic growth, again, we need to invest in the future. I, I, I'm all for it. I'm not saying, oh, you know, it's all going to zero and you have to buy Bitcoin. That's not the point. I'm saying that, that when I look at us investing in airlines and savings casinos and saving cruise ship companies and things like that, instead of investing in artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, and things like that, which are the future, Right, the future of finance is is uh, is you know it's, it is 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 about the, the blockchain, about this completely decentralized uh, mechanism of transacting. Right, uh, so you you've seen several recessions, right? I mean, you've like you said, you've you've joined in '87. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure you you saw the '91, the 2000 recession, 2008. So, do you see it getting worse and worse and worse? Because basically every recession the bailout you just add a zero right i mean 2008 was 800 billion now it's going to be 8 trillion and uh, the one before that like uh, um 2000 i think the fed didn't do that much 2001 i think the fed did uh, very little and uh, you know and so on so so when you look at these cycles and uh, um, do you see them getting to the point where again the next event is going to require hundreds of trillions of dollars instead of tens of trillions of dollars. So what what what's what's the trajectory here? It it is scary, but I don't think um, each event had its own uh, fundamental um, root causes uh, that distinguished it from from the next or or uh, prior event. And so I think this is a this is a particularly um, nasty one because notwithstanding what, what's happened to a segment of the stock market since the lows of March, there is um, some pretty significant embedded damage that's been caused. And, and I would argue irreparable damage, irrespective of what government support uh, has been put in place. And, um, and so that, that, that's concerning. I, I, I don't know what that's going to mean if there's a resurgence of of the virus, and then what does the Fed do then? If we find ourselves in in the winter of 2020-2021, uh, seeing some of the same problems we saw this past year, uh, what do they do? Right? Uh, I think that's your that's part of your question. Or what happens when COVID twenty comes, or or some some other virus in the future? Uh, there's no way to project how we're going to end up handling that uh, unless, like I said before, we flip out of all the investments we made at a profit. But by then it'll be too late, right? So I, I, I just think trying to project uh, what, what's going to happen in the future based upon what's happened in the past, you know, uh, that's been a tool used by a lot of folks on Wall Street. And I don't, I, you know, I, I like the adage it, it's not 
history isn't uh, indicative of, uh, of the future. Right. So, well, wait, when you deflate one bubble, all you're doing is creating another bubble, right? So you can, you can, keep, you can pl keep playing that game all day long unless you're solving the fundamental problem you know, and then this is, goes back to like Keynesian versus Austrian economics and, and the fact that we are based on consumption, right? I mean, our entire economy is based on the U.S. consumer taking more debt. Right. And, and if you talk to folks outside of the United States, they'll all tell you that everything in the world is dependent upon the U.S. consumer, right? Yeah. That's what they, they bank on. And the U.S. consumer who's, uh, who's, you know, has been quarantined for the last three months. Not just that they've been quarantined, also uh, savings are at all-time high, like 15 or 16 percent. And, and that tells you that even after reopening and even though they can order anything they want on Amazon, people are very nervous and they're very worried. And, and that reduction is the new normal. This is not like a temporary, again, the music stop and when we restart, everything is going back to normal. I, you know, like... Monday, uh, uh, New York opened, and my wife asked me, okay, are you going to the office? And, and I was like, no, I actually like this arrangement. <laughs> I think this is a new normal, you know? So, so after you get used to something for several months and you realize that you can work remotely and you don't need to commute and be in the same office with everybody, uh, everything changes. So now commercial real estate changed. Now all the restaurants and all the venues that serve all this commercial stuff uh, all have to adjust and so on. So, so I think... We're going through this cascade, and like you said, it takes three to four years. So we're going to see a lot of bankruptcies come out of this, and it's going to be 2003, 2004 before to 2023, 2024 before we come out of it. That's what. what do you see any way of avoiding the cycle? That's that's part of maybe the question that I was asking. No, I, I don't, uh, because again, I think that the. Uh, uh, the businesses that are impaired, this is a, probably a pretty harsh statement, we're already bad businesses. Yeah. Anyway. Who, let, do, you, who, do, you know, who do you know who, who says to you, Alex, I want to get into the restaurant business. I, that's really, I, I've gone to school, to, you know, they might, everyone might, and by the way, there's probably a lot of cooks that came out of this thing. Everyone in my house has become a professional chef. But, um, but to then take that passion to, to go to open a, a, a restaurant, you know, they're just going to realize the, the, the idiocy of that. So I think there's, you know, but yet we love restaurants. Everyone loves eating out in restaurants. And before this uh, virus came upon us, you walk around New York City and every restaurant was full. Yeah. So, and so they were barely making money. They were barely making barely money. Barely making cool. money. So, so how are they going to run at 50%? Right. How, you know... Take that logic to the to the retailers. J.C. Penney was a crappy business since the financial crisis. They should have gone in ba into bankruptcy. Then they avoided it. They 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 did the extend and pretend, and now they're out of business. And they're still opening up 500 stores even while they're in bankruptcy. It's it's mind blowing to me. Macy's just mortgaged what what little equity they had left in their real estate uh, to to keep themselves alive, and 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 that. To me, the day they borrowed the billion eight dollars uh, and, and secured it with their real estate was the end of of their existence. You know, yeah, we might not spiral. see it, but we, right? It's they, a spiral they, they you don't get out of uh, right. if you're in the wrong business. So Wall Street, you know, I don't want you know we we've been negative since we started this interview. So let's talk about some positive things. The the uh, you know Wall Street, in my view, already picked the winners and the losers, and and the winners are the guys that are the future. The winners are the cloud. The winners are Zoom, right? The, what we're using right now. The winners are are the people who enable remote learning and things like that. So, so um, you you've been again. Your uh, Third Avenue is famous for for value investing, famous for asset allocation and all that stuff, and you've been running the firm for a long time. You have a new product. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about how you pick winners. How do you ex how do you win the against the index? Because you know Warren Buffett famously said, right? He took a, a big bets against people who said, "Oh, I can I can beat the the index." No, you can't. It's, it's so hard. So how do you beat the index? Because you recently got awarded uh, a very prestigious prize, right? So tell us about that. Brag a little bit, Dave. Come on. All right, well, look. Let me start by by twisting your brain, your very, very intelligent brain for a second. Everyone is trained on Wall Street. Again, if you want to go into the investment management business or, or be on Wall Street, your, your sole 
mission in life is identifying, researching, using information in a superior manner to pick winners. Pick those winners and then try to consistently outperform whatever your underlying benchmark may be. And, and when folks struggle with that, because most do, they, they take a new benchmark, find a new benchmark so that they can look better against that benchmark. You know, the hedge fund industry is a self-creation. They were, they were all set up to, to beat the S&P. And then when they couldn't beat the S&P, they created the HFRI, the hedge fund index. And then they, they just basically took themselves, amalgamated a, a return, and then they just try and beat the return. But it's really their own return. And their returns are sub part of the S&P 500. So you ever compare the, what the hedge fund universe has done, they've actually been unable to beat the S&P for quite some time. There are, uh, there are exceptions. Those are the smartest, the best. But most of those guys have announced that they've retired or gone on to own football teams. So And, and they fail, especially when they increase the asset base. That's right. right. It's, it's one thing to win it with $5 million and it's another with $5 billion. So let me posit this to you. I would tell you that it is much easier to identify losers than it is to pick winners. So my... My insight out of spending 25 years building an asset management franchise only to watch it go down in flames was we kept thinking we were smarter than the market. We could pick winners. And, and we consistently were unable to identify winners as measured against the performance that we were supposed to deliver, otherwise known as alpha, right? We were unable to deliver alpha because it was too hard to pick winners when the wave of capital was flowing into these passive index strategies. It doesn't matter which one you want to pick, large cap, small cap, international, emerging markets, whatever you want to identify yourself against, those indices kept trouncing the active managers who were trying to find the alpha in those underlying constituent securities. So my insight is much easier to identify losers, just what to avoid, as opposed to which ones are going to succeed. And, and you win by definition if you just avoid the bad guys. Exactly. So like here's a, a, a fantastic fact. If you just didn't own GE in an S&P 500 fund, you outperformed the S&P by 72 basis points for the last five years. Just one stock. Right. Because that stock, which was a top 10 position in the S&P 500, has just gone like this, right? And... And, and, and that's with some of the best and smartest investors being substantial holders. And in one case, Nelson Peltz, a very well-known investor yeah. with a fantastic track record, stepping onto the board of the company and still watching the stock go from 60 to 7. So, so I, I, I'd say to you, boy, if you just didn't have GE, look how good you've done. So I started working on creating, in effect, a, a, a multi-factor um, um, analysis on, on how, to, how to identify losers, but let, let the fundamental factor do it. And we're not talking about the academic factors, like the Fama French factors. We're talking about true fundamental measurements of a company's performance that we look at every quarter and we score it. And then I just take the 250 lowest scores and eliminate them from the largest 500 companies in the U.S. equity market cap larger uh, marketplace. And just by doing that, and we launched our index, the X out index, and that's the name, the brand name we've used, because think about it, it's X out. Uh, you know, X out is uh, golf balls or crappy golf balls. You know, when golf, golf ball manufacturers don't make a perfect golf ball, they put triple X's on it and then they throw them in a pool and then they sell them for a discount. So where to, I thought about X out as a great, uh, symbol, it would, it's a great stock ticker also. Um, and we just X out of the largest 500, the 250 losers. And we're, since the launch in July of the index, it's, um, as of yesterday, close to 970 basis points better than the S&P through this pandemic, which in, in less than one year time frame, almost one year, uh, was better than any back test that we've done in trying to figure out how to build this. And so what I, what I tell you is going on is you, you said the markets picked the winners. That might be the case, 
but all we really did was avoid the losers. And those factors that we use, there are seven of them, are meant to remove the companies. And all we focus on is the removal that are being disrupted by technological change. That's, yeah, so it, that's, that, that's the other insight. No, and, and you're right. I mean, right now, it, it, the coronavirus slash this recession is accelerating that disruption. Exactly. So, so, so picking, do you, do you see it, it becoming easier to pick or is it not easier to pick considering what just happened? No, easier. Easier to pick. Easier because, because the, the, what I don't, don't think the, the market recognizes and I still don't think the market recognizes is the speed of accelerating technological change is not priced in. And, and, and notwithstanding what, what folks think the, the market's ahead of itself, I don't understand how this could run away like this. There's Robin Hood, millions of small investors running the market up. I mean, the most ridiculous things come out of the, out of the pundits on Wall Street, you know, that, that, that they actually believe that stuff. The reality is we just don't comprehend. Maybe you might because you're, you're in the disruption business, but the, the market doesn't comprehend the speed that technological change can have on businesses and industries. Yes. And, and so I think as that acceleration continues, and whether we believe in Moore's law, we don't, right? Computing power is going to continue to double. Um, and, and I think quantum computing has an impact on, on continuing to maintain that, even though there are lots of people out there that believe we can't keep up with Moore's law. Um, this, these changes occur. Now, the pandemic has put a firecracker into uh, the acceleration to speed it up, but, but there'll be something else that we just haven't projected that you might know. Uh, because well, you the disruption, it. you're right, the disruption is like a speed bump. It slows down all the bad companies, and it, but it allows to the, the fast guys to accelerate even further. And, and, and I wanted to ask you another question. The, the, if you looked at the market two years ago, I think the kind of accepted notion was managed uh, funds are history. It's all about index investing because uh, no one can beat the index. And, and do you see that changing now be because of the events that just happened? I mean, are people kind of looking at uh, smart managers or people who have a lot of experience and saying, gosh, I, I need this wisdom. I need somebody to help me because if I just stay with the index, I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm gonna miss all the big stuff that's about to happen. No, I, I think that what I've learned and now confirmed with my own new venture, rules-based methodologies are the only way to invest because the biases of humans are flawed. You know, if you've seen, uh, even during this, this, um, this market volatility, certain managers just hold on to, the, to their picks because of their personal convictions, their personal biases override fundamentals and and when they see stocks like the fang stocks which none of them or many of them don't own because at least all of them they won't own they might own one or two of them but they can't own all of them because they have to they have to distinguish themselves right they have to be differentiated and 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 they can't subscribe to the valuations whatever that may mean uh, of those securities because of um, perceived uh, overvalue that that they just they let their personal biases drive these things. So I, I think um, I think you have to stay with a rules based methodology. Now there might be versions of what I've created that are a better way to invest depending upon what your your own personal bias is. That's the that's the act of the decision. And the active decision is where do I want to allocate my capital? And and I would argue that uh, Warren Buffett also said when he passes, he wants his money to go into a Vanguard broad market index fund because he acknowledged that's the best way for over a long period of time to, to make money. I, I'd echo that, but I'd tell you that there are ways with components of your personal portfolio that you can allocate to specific strategies and do better. Now, if I'm creating a thousand basis points of alpha in one year, uh, just by exclusion, 
yeah, everyone should take some percentage of what they own in a broad market index and put it in this thing because you can't, you know, you, you can't replicate that anywhere else. And it's relatively inexpensive. You're not paying 2% and 20%. Yep. And, and you would pay someone two and 20 to have a thousand basis points of outperformance willingly. That's right. So, so let's talk about non-correlated assets. So, so do you see this pandemic slash recession changing the allocation? Are you uh, encouraging people to allocate more to non-correlated like gold or Bitcoin or anything like that? Or are you seeing, or you feel that you still want, want to have most of your assets in, uh, in real estate or in the, in the stock market? Well, that there, in, in any asset allocation um, model, because the, the world has evolved into this, if you want to call it new normal or whatever, low interest rate environment that's going to persist for some period of time, right? At, at least for as far out as we can see. Um, 30 years at least, yes. Yeah, like, you know, what, you know, and, and what does that mean for the, the massive amounts of capital and pensions that have 7% bogeys as the return scenarios they need just to, to survive, right? To not go into default themselves, right? Into underfunding. Um, and so how do you do that, right? You can't do it in fixed income. Uh, doesn't, it, it's not there anymore. So, so you have to be in equities. And, and as a result, um, should, should folks, I'm, I'm not a gold bug, so it's hard. There, people view gold for all different kinds of reasons. My distribution partner on XOUT has um, a great gold alternative to GLD. It's, it's called BAR. Uh, it's the same thing except 17 basis point expense ratio versus 40 for GLD. So if you want to own gold, that's the best way to own gold. You just buy a gold ETF. Well, actually, the best, the best is Celsius. We pay 3% positive yield on gold. Yes. Yes, that's true. <laughs> it's a new product we just launched. So, I, I, uh, I, I did review that on your website. I was very impressed. I was going to ask you questions about it. Um, but it, it's, it is um, certainly for those folks who, who want to have, whether it be a hedge or a, a place to store capital while you're waiting for an appropriate environment to over allocate to whatever other asset class you want. But I don't think, um, you know, the, the folks who've, who've, who've put money into alternative assets, whether it's some commodity-based strategies or forest land or agriculture, other things have all, you know, and now real estate is a, especially commercial real estate is a troubled asset class, you know, have, have not, it has not worked out for them. So it seems to me that as you look at the macro, equities are the only place to be. And then your, your, your judgment has to be, um, are the mega techs, which are growing at this, this um, crazy rate, capable of continuing that into the future? I don't know if you follow a, a guy named Scott Galloway, who's a professor at NYU just put out a piece this week about how they have to double their income capabilities to justify where their stocks are trading and how a companies those bi that big can double their income. You know, I, he, he called that into question. Or, or, or we have an expansion, a permanent expansion in multiples because of the low interest rates, right? So Warren Buffett says famously, right, tell me what the interest rate is and I'll tell you what the multiples are. So, right. so I think we are in, in, in this new normal where uh, the valuations don't matter anymore because like you said, if money is coming out of bonds and that's, you talk about hundreds of trillions of dollars that has to come out of there and there's no other way to go, then maybe the stock market is not overpricing its winners, right? That's what the key is, is there's the fangs that everybody's saying, oh, how can Amazon be trading at $2,500 a share? Well, if there's nothing else to go into and they continue their growth and there's multiple expansion, maybe it is not priced so badly compared to where, where the world is going. So last question, let me, this is the moment everybody I think was waiting for. 
a, you know, what do you think about Bitcoin and why Wall Street hates Bitcoin? Yeah, I think what the biggest um, challenge you face, you being a, a representative of a cryptocurrency, is, is a legitimizing uh, force. And um, just having, uh, you know, M Mike Novogratz uh, on CNBC, it seems like almost weekly now, uh, talking up his personal book, isn't going to cut it. And so what I what I'd suggest is, you know, the, the all the effort should be placed on continuing to find legitimizers to make it a um, uh, a a tool that that can be used and used with great comfort. That uh, for all the reasons people are afraid of it, and and there still is this perception. I'll speak for myself personally that. It's a, it's a tool used for people who are seeking to circumvent the law. And so if the only folks that are, uh, are using it, or, or you know, hackers who hijacked, uh, hijacked uh, um, computer-based databases or otherwise say, well, pay me in Bitcoin or, or crypto and I'll release you. It, you know, once that, uh, those type folks are squashed and the, maybe governments or, uh, or other legitimate counterparties step into the fray in a, in a larger way that you guys can, can expose and, and use as a tool, that's when I think it, it just takes on a, a whole new life of its own. I, I am a personal owner of Bitcoin and, and, um, and have a Coinbase account. I should switch over to Celsius. I'll do that after this call. But, um, but it's one of, uh, I think, my... My concern, I, I did it just as a, uh, just because I wanted to be a participant and follow along what's happening. It will keep me interested that way. But it's my children who exposed me to it in the first place. They're the ones who are the, the believers. So maybe that's the, the secondary. If, if you don't have a legitimizer, uh, whether it be a government or, or uh, well, Warren Buffett goes into the market and buys it. You know, he doesn't believe it right <laughs> Uh, kind of what I, I agree with you. I think we definitely need uh, more utility and less volatility in this business, you know, so okay. So all right, thank, David, this was amazing. Thanks for your time. I know you have to run uh, just tell our viewers where they can find uh, this X out product. How do they register? And uh, again, just give them an allocation. They want to hear from the pros. What allocation? Right. So um, so X out capital my company is an indexer. Uh, as you know, you can't invest in an index you can invest, invest in a, an exchange traded fund or note that tracks an index. In this case, Granite Shares is the issuer of the ETF that, that you can acquire. Uh, the symbol is XOUT. You can buy that through any brokerage account. It's available uh, in any denomination. So it's a real easy thing to buy and it should be free. There should be no commission that you pay to buy it. Uh, you can you can learn more about this index and and the uh, underlying ETF at um, www.xalcapital.com. So you can learn about that. Uh, our index calculation agent has a really cool video, not as cool as yours, but uh, a cool video. So that's something you should do. And and I think um, you know everyone should be exposed to the U.S. large cap market. It, it is um, the best uh, the best if you will, um, index that exists, whether it be the S&P 500 or the Vanguard large cap market, it doesn't really matter. Everyone should have some component of their exposure. And, and I think if you, whatever your equity exposure, your exposure to that particular market is, you should put at least 10% of that into XF and then watch it. And then over time, you'll ultimately make it 100%, but, but start with 10 and, and you'll uh, be able to compare what's, what's going on and, and, and you'll be able to see, you can get transparency into what we don't own. And that's really the, the, the key message to leave you with. It's more important what you leave out of your portfolio than what you put in it. All right, David, we'll be checking in with you six months from now to see if X out beats Bitcoin. Okay, that will be the measurement or gold. We'll put those three next to each other they're, see, they're definitely point. correlated, but I, I'm, I'm willing to take that bet on. I think that's a good one. All right. We're, we're All on. Right. All right. Starbucks. Perfect. Thanks for the time. See you.